Hi. Uh, thank you for joining today's kickoff webin webinar to reflect on the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge and its two-year anniversary. I am Allison Brooks. I'm Executive Director of the Bay Area Regional Collaborative, uh, which you can learn more about if you go to bark.ca.gov. And I was also chair of the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge um, as it was underway two years ago. Uh, before we uh, kick off, I want to acknowledge help from our partner, Amy Chester at Rebuild by Design, who I am working with on, um, on this two-year anniversary, and also Zoe Siegel, who is staff to the effort, who's now at Greenbelt Alliance, and Lucian Go, who's program quarter, coordinator at the Bay Area Regional Collaborative. So this was designed as a six-part webinar series in lieu of being able to get together in person to, to celebrate you know, the effort that we all experienced together. And the, the, the idea over the next the series is to really highlight all the work that's been underway uh, around the region in communities uh, around resiliency and, and adapting to climate change that, that resulted a lot from the Resilient by Design experience and also progress on regional scale efforts uh, related to climate adaptation and resiliency. And the idea behind this first webinar was uh, really to highlight the role of design and design thinking and bringing together multiple issues that communities are, are dealing with and um, whether it's now, uh, and whether it's affordability and, and inequality and, um, current issues and also thinking to the future and the uncertain future we have before us and um, the types of solutions we can develop together. And we conceptualized this a couple weeks ago, really, as we were dealing with the health pandemic and, um, and the crisis there and thinking about the role of design in uh, helping to address that issue now and into the future. And of course, here we are today, and I know we're all, um, you know, a challenge in experiencing the protest on, you know, we're experiencing on the streets, the mass protest in response to George Floyd's killing by police officers in Minneapolis. And we know that uh, the, the many uh, African-American men and women that have, um, you know, been uh, experienced police brutality. And it, and it really did make this current moment in time has certainly made me and I know uh, others and um, we'll talk about it some today, reflect on the experiences that we had uh, with Resilient by Design, the many important and, and challenging conversations we had talking about resiliency, talking about climate adaptation, and being pushed by community members in many Bay Area communities to uh, really recognize that uh, communities of color are dealing with a whole host of issues. And so it's important in the public sector, or the design community, or anybody working together with community on these issues, recognize that it's beyond a building, it's beyond um, a marsh or a, a, a seawall, but we're talking about all the many multitude of issues that we need to work on together and recognize that our frontline communities deal with front and center on a daily basis. And it's our responsibility to come to the table and continue to have this dialogue. So that's really what um, these, this, this is an ongoing conversation. We experienced um, the, the incredible learning and partnership and the uh, network that was built during Resilient by Design. We wanna continue that conversation and work together because the only way we're going to work through the challenges that we're dealing with now in our communities is to actually work together, listen and learn from each other and um, continue to work together to, to problem solve around these incredible challenges that we're all experiencing. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I really appreciate the, the designers that are participating in this conversation today who were, front, were instrumental in um, some of the great and amazing concepts that came out of Resilient by Design and many of which are moving forward. And so I'm going to hand it over to Kathy Simon who's going to help moderate the conversation today. Uh, thank Kathy. you, Allison. Um, my, mm -hmm. my um, goal is really to set the table for these five amazing designers who are going to speak to you. And 
we are, as designers, think about the physical world, but we also, I think, as, as Allison pointed out, think about the world of social issues, the world of equity, the world of climate change, the, all these things that we find ourselves facing today. And in the Bay Area, we are in a unique position and a very challenging position to really think about how to deal with that. And we have a beautiful, beautiful place here. And you can see from this aerial photograph we are a combination of what I call the cultural landscape, the built landscape, and amazing nature. Next, please, Lucian. Uh, we have, this slide really shows it. We have the city, whether it's San Francisco or Oakland or San Leandro or San Jose or, or any city in the North Bay. Uh, and we have an incredible natural world. And the two coming together is how I think we as designers can really position ourselves to help imagine and actually create a new kind of future for this wonderful region. Next, please. Um, we have amazing access to nature. And, you know, one of my hopes is that some of the slowdown that we've experienced with COVID could actually be a teaching moment for us and how to live in a better way with the natural world. Next, please. Design can make places for nature, but it also can make places for people. And this is Chrissy Field, as you, some of you know, this is a park that was designed by, among others, Kevin Conger, who will be speaking to you later. But it's, it's a way of making common ground for people. And design has the power to take something that was a really beat up um, place and make it into something that's wonderful and that's used, next please, by many, many people in the community. So one of the ways we can do this is by creating really accessible, equitable open space, which combines nature and culture together. Next, please. We can also think about buildings as we do as architects, some of us. Uh, we think very strongly about how through our work in buildings or making new buildings or repurposing older buildings can create common ground for community. Next. And Claire Weiss. Great. Thanks, Kathy, um, for, as an architect, setting up another architect to reflect uh -huh. on two years ago. And, um, and again, I want, really want to thank um, Allison, Amy Chester, all of the staff at kind of setting up this series of discussions so that we can kind of explain in a way, our reflection. So I thought Christopher Alexander was right on here and it's also an excuse to have the eminent Bay Area urbanist and architect talk. But I think a lot of people assume that resilient by design was about master planning, that somehow we were all gonna come up with a big plan and that plan would answer all questions and solve all things. And so I think it's, interesting to reflect why it was a good idea not to have that. And I think this quote about how, uh, and so apt today as we look at what the meaning of order is and control and planning about the beauty of thinking about how things can happen organically, that we can adapt to natural and unpredictable changes. And we're in that time. Next slide. So, I, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, we came into this as, at the time, a New York-based firm that had been able to work with the community on, in, on the right-hand side, the East River Blue Way that turned into another rebuild project that is um, on, along the Lower East Side that's looking at primarily flooding um, and sea level rise to, uh, kind of looking at whether there was larger visions of how energy, nature could actually help people adapt to a future 100 years from now in New York and the Bay called Blue Dunes to something very tangible, which was working with communities on rebuilding a destroyed boardwalk. So next slide. When we kind of got together as the bionic team and ended up in the second part of Rebuild, focusing on a particular place, which is San Rafael, we, I couldn't help but uh, reflect on the fact that 
it really is these specific communities and those communities that are essentially the front lines, the essential workers, the ones that have been suffering most from rising real estate prices, from lack of housing security, from basically jobs that require long commutes, and from a housing market that's so tight that we looked at places they were living in all over the Bay Area. And there was very little, in a sense, appetite to talk about housing as part of Rebuild by Design. And I think for a lot of us coming from other places in the country, that was really disappointing that in fact, it wasn't primarily focused on basically how to create more room for nature by having more housing security for people and safer places. And I think we tried to figure out a ways to have um, a kind of learnings around that, but also to learn from the community about how important places like this community center uh, was. So if you go to the next slide about sort of combining a bridge and now it turns out it's COVID or it was the fires while we were doing this, it's not always the disaster that we think it's going to be, you know. Um, it may not be the relentless storm. It may actually be a um, kind of a, someone's immune system that the storm is happening in. So I think that that idea of not a process that just doesn't solve one problem, but creates a process of dialogue is really important. So I wanted to just reflect in the last slide on what we didn't talk about on Rebuild. So Rebuild, I think, was organized really well because there was a first part where all the teams were in research mode and they looked at the whole bay. So coming out of that, and you can see our slide, bionic slide to the left, where we started really being intrigued by two communities that were joined by a bridge, and a bridge that in our estimations, you can tell below, could be a lot more things than what it is today. It could be a lifeline, it could be for bikes, it could actually be for nature, it could, uh, and that was considered, I think, a bridge too far. But when I reflect on it now, it's really those issues of continuity, whether it's um, Allison Sant, uh, Studio for Urban Projects, who was part of our team organizing bike, you know, bike site visits, or in the end, if it isn't really taking on the big infrastructure projects. But in light of what's been going on in the country for years, and the, there was one elephant in the room, uh, one community we didn't talk to, and that was San Quentin. So, we think about these two communities and there's a community that's not even on our map here that I think we all, when we think about resiliency and adaptation, we really have to include restorative thinking um, for everyone and on every level. Uh, and now I'm passing it off to the next slide, staying within my four minutes. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Josiah Kane here with Sherwood Design Engineers. Um, I can resonate with a lot of that around, you know, a great big master plan. And is there a point at which the vision is so large that you can't build a bridge between the process we're in and the, and the current trajectory and this huge, this larger vision? And you know, that's interesting in the current climate for sure. Um, going to the next slide. Our first big concept, this is the area we're looking at. Um, it's interesting because as it happens, uh, we have dog patch on the right here to the north and baby to the left. Um, two of the four hardest hit neighborhoods for coronavirus. And also uh, all four neighborhoods, if you include Petro Hill and the mission, um, uh, well, and Soma, um, those are kind of the top five neighborhoods. And none of them really have open space. Um, and they all have um, justice issues in one form or another. And we see, so we see that emerging with coronavirus. A big part of this project was trying to resolve 
some of those things. You know, we started out with the idea of a social ecosystem, um, moving ahead, um, looking at natural systems and urban systems and trying to understand how they're not necessarily oppositional, but how they can be integrated into one functional system um, moving forward. Um, and really looking at how sort of climate stresses and urban stresses are not necessarily um, independent either, right? So looking at things like sea level rise and groundwater and seismic hazards, um, also looking at things like displacement and accessibility. And so we were really grappling with, you know, how to um, really address these physical issues that are occurring on the waterfront um, in the context of other social issues that are happening there. And, you know, I think that we were thinking more in terms of um, protecting the social infrastructure that's there, but we certainly didn't imagine something like what we have now. Um, move to the next slide. So our fundamental process was looking at protecting that physical edge. Um, in this case, very much a sea level rise issue, although also some upstream flooding and infrastructure issues that are there. Um, restoring the environment, which is a really big deal. Um, is this creek, the largest watershed in San Francisco. Um, it's almost completely underground at this point and very industrial. So trying to restore that clean environment, um, connect the people, the sources and the flows. It's a, a very big logistics area. Also historically um, housed and employed actually, uh, very large African-American community around um, the Navy essentially, and the shipyard, um, and then longshoremen, and that's gradually declined over time, trying to reconnect the people, the housing, um, the economics, et cetera, and then, and then grow that identity so that the community that does lift up is the same community that's there now. Um, moving on. And so we really found ourselves in this idea of a social ecosystem, looking at a very large group of people, trying to understand how they all connect. And I think to a great extent, we were very successful in connecting people to a city that they hadn't really spoken to or trusted in perhaps decades um, and building sort of a, you know, a collaborative, uh, stance in the neighborhood. Um, I think we overly focused on a huge vision and also on a very sort of physical um, response. And I guess I'm left with sort of how to best move things in the short term toward this big vision and not because everything happens, you know, one step at a time. Um, the existing process sort of being on a slightly different trajectory and not being able to realize this. Um, but then also just really thinking about that social fabric and that social infrastructure. Um, you know, it's not a coincidence that these communities that are already hardest hit by these physical threats um, are also hardest hit by the pandemic, which is, I guess, also a physical threat. Um, and then beyond that, some of the obvious um, tensions around social and racial equity that are happening as well right now. So there's been a lot to think about as far as how this plan may or may not address um, some of those things we weren't thinking about. But I do feel like the, if there were a big open space there that that may actually be helpful. And um, maybe I have one more slide, but I think I'm about done. Yeah, just looking at the various communities that we that we worked with. Um, keep going. And that's it. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Conger from CMG Landscape Architecture. And um, C CMG was one member of a really big team called the All Bay, All Bay Collective, uh, which um, 
worked on the estuary commons project in East Oak Oakland. Um, next slide, please. And I, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about our project at estuary commons, but I'm going to mostly try and reiterate some of the points that others have made about the, the, the overall takeaways from the RBD challenge and the, the lessons learned and how I'm hopeful that those are um, informing new work and, and uh, future work around the Bay Area. <clears throat> and some of the really big uh, takeaways for me were, um, first of all, that this was a design driven challenge, that the idea that design um, be in the forefront, um, I thought was really critical. Uh, secondly, that it was regional across the entire Bay and not just um, area by area. And thirdly, that it was comprehensive in the, in the scope of issues as has been mentioned by uh, a few of the speakers, and particularly around social vul vulnerabilities in uh, which included issues of, of income, income, access to education, health and safety, and, and really was, was more than just uh, physical design or flood protection. Uh, next slide. So uh, quickly, this is the site that our team focused on. This is called the Estuary. And it is, uh, in fact, a community that is diverse and, and complicated and is affected by a lot of those issues of vulnerability um, that I just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, it, there's a lot of infrastructure there. The airport is right there. There's some, um, some communities that have been um, really had had uh, that are vulnerable and have had limited access to um, education, food, um, food safety, all of those um, critical things. Uh, next slide. The plan that the team um, looked into was attempted attempting to be fully comprehensive. Of, of course, it included um, affordable housing. Of course, it included um, open space for nature and health and recreation and um, people's enjoyment. It looked in a big way at mobility and infrastructure, um, and importantly, tried to advance a set of community planning tools that would put that would empower the community itself to be um, more in charge of the future uh, of this part of the of the Bay Area. Next image. Uh, it included, uh, um, of course. Um, nature-based solutions that improved ecology and nature in the Bay and gave people access to the Bay. Next image. And I think um, in the more, some of the more interesting ways tackled the issues of um, governance and funding as a way to empower the local community to put them more in charge of the of the decisions and the changes that were to happen within their community around housing, jobs, um, around um, education, food, uh, all of those things, and had some interesting ideas around um, resilient equity hubs, which were sort of a community benefit district um, idea or, or some version of that, which I thought um, ha has a lot of potential actually uh, in moving forward. And next slide. And also uh, tackled some of the big um, challenges with the way that infrastructure is dividing this community and particularly separating it um, from the Bay and from nature. And I just want to point, and this is showing um, a, a rebuilding of the um, 880 to put that underground and create a new transit hub there that stitches the community back um, towards the Bay. And I, I really just want to acknowledge that this, this idea and the idea of the of the previous slide, these are really, really complicated and really, really challenging and not something that can be solved in a, a short um, design challenge. But I think really important to get on the table and to get um, a conversation going around these issues. Um, next slide. And I wanted to kind of give a shout out to the Common Ground team, which is not really um, included in today's presentation. Hopefully they'll be in some of the other um, seminars. but. I want to get to the point of the role of design in, in dealing with these issues and the ability for designers to help visualize and inspire a better future. And this was one of the favorite images for me and most beautiful images that I think came out of the, the whole RBD challenge and I think really illustrates how um, the power of visual, visualization um, can is, is really a tool that designers can bring to this conversation. Um, next image. I want to just talk quickly about moving forward and introduce another project that I'm involved in. 
um, with Kathy actually in the Port of San Francisco, which is the San Francisco Waterfront Resilience Program, which is looking at a, a 100 year time horizon for the seven and a half miles that are under the port jurisdiction and is, um, is, has a mission of creating a self equitable, sustainable and inspiring waterfront. And is really, I think, learning a lot from the RBD challenge experience. Lindy Lowe is the urban design project manager for the port on this, and she was very much involved in the RBD challenge um, project. And if you go to the next slide, I just want to sh talk briefly about a couple things. One is that we're really taking seriously this idea of empowering communities and, and engaging communities early in a way that we talk to people about what is important to them and what matters to them and what their priorities are and, and attempting to really put them in the driver's seat about what should be the long-term future of these communities and all the different neighborhoods around, um, around the waterfront. And then the next slide, do some very preliminary renderings um, of the plan, but also again, trying to use this idea of design as a way to visualize and inspire and help um, move ideas forward and um, motivate everybody involved to kind of work towards a better future. Uh, thank you. Next speaker. There we go. Hi, I'm um, Marcel Wilson, Design Director at Bionic. And um, our office was fortunate enough to, to uh, lead a team during Resilient by Design in collaboration with WXY and Claire Weiss, as well as Penn Design and, and several, um, several other firms um, who all played a big part in um, our main question, which was in, in the face of so many stressors today uh, in the Bay Area, who, who needs help first? And uh, we arrived at the conclusion through a pretty deep analysis that it was San Rafael. And, uh, and, and our, our uh, team came around to a position of um, trying to suggest how an entire city could reposition itself in the Bay Area, not as a sleepy hamlet, but as a, as a city that's part in, of the uh, critical infrastructure of the Bay Area and its economy. Next. Um, San Rafael had um, very you know, deep structural problems and uh, our team proposed a variety of catalysts and pilot projects that could correct those problems over time, transform um, uh, a large area at the scale of the city and lift everyone up. Uh, to elevate San Rafael was was I think our you know our philosophical um, and and design objective, and so there are a range of pilot projects in there to transform it over time. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of those was um, probably the the place that is most important to uh, a community that has been discriminated against and disenfranchised for 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 a long time. Uh, that's the the canal community and this is pickleweed park and the idea with pickleweed park was that um it could be a resilience uh, hub for day-to-day -day needs um and to build the community and its sort of social infrastructure and connectivity next slide but also um as a as a place that um could could serve that community very precisely in times of of stress uh so that they may sustain a shock and, and remain there. Um, and so um, th that was one of several uh, projects. And I don't think anybody uh, in, in our team or other teams thought that um, we were gonna leave Resilient by Design and people were gonna go out and, and build those projects. Um, if you fast forward to today, um, next slide, um, you know, uh, Marin County is a place for their sort of decades of of, of racism and, 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 and social issues embedded in the culture there. Um, the, the issues of today, COVID-19, uh, and the things we see on the news, those are just ex exacerbated uh, and accentuated by, by COVID, uh, uh, even in, in Marin County. Um, uh, what has changed over that time? Um, uh, the canal, uh, the canal district uh, was was dedicated as an opportunity zone in the in the Trump tax bill. Uh, that's created additional stresses, um, uh, evictions, rent hikes to people who um, really 
um, are, are most in need uh, and play a vital role in, 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 the, in the county and in the region. Um, uh, today, because of COVID, the Marine County Food Bank is uh, oversubscribed. Uh, they're, seeing, um, they're seeing types of need that they've never seen before. And there are stories of uh, Pickleweed Park um, functioning as the community center uh, and that kind of, um, uh, and to form social cohesion that, that we knew it performed, um, but they're just now more acute. One of my favorite sort of anecdotes is that families are pulling up to the uh, community center and they're kind of blasting Wi-Fi out um, into the parking lot so that um, kids can have access to Wi-Fi to, to continue their education. Um, so I'd say, uh, if reflecting back on resilient by design, I think generally uh, we got we our team got it right uh, about um, about San Rafael as a place and how it needs to become uh, and how how it needs to find a way to transform about the the place that most acutely affected people, Pickleweed Park, uh, and how that 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 project's still valid. Um, and and so when we ask ourselves, you know, what what is the role of design now? Um, you know, there's a big push, I think, everywhere to kind of go back to normal. And I'd maintain that nobody, that, that there's a large contingency of people that don't want to go back to normal. Um, they want something different. And you can, you can see that on the news. Um, I'm sure that um, there are lots of examples of that. But going back to normal is actually not where we need to go. Um, I think the role of design is actually to show where we can go. Um, right now, more than ever, um, there's probably not money to do the big things. Um, but there is the body of evidence and work that all the projects from Resilient by Design created um, that can, can demonstrate um, where, you know, where we should go as a, as a society and a region. And, um, and I would just end by saying, you know, the, the designers are still here. Um, we, we're still the ones that hold these ideas and can still, you know, promote them and advance them um, in our sort of collective conversation about the future. Veronica. Thank you, Marcel. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Veronica Rivera with uh, James Corner Field Operations, and we led the field operations team. Uh, we proposed as part of the RBD effort, the South Bay Sponge. Next. And uh, in that effort, we, we basically went back to the origins, right? The, the most resilient of all infrastructures, which is nature itself, and, and understanding nature as a sponge, a sponge that could address stormwater uh, runoff as well as sea level rise. Next. And we're fortunate in the Bay to have a lot of this, but obviously there's, there's a need for more. Next. And as part of the, of the effort, we, we looked at over 30 miles of the South Bay and with a series of, of swaps and kind of restructuring of, of urban and, and natural systems, uh, created an armature that even though we applied it in the South Bay can kind of be applied anywhere in the Bay Area because the challenge was, was to kind of address the, the, the genesis of the, of the issue and not necessarily see it as a, as a formal exercise, but, but a kit of parts that could be applied uh, everywhere. Next. And the, the essence or the kind of conclusion of the process, I think, was the possibility of, of taking, taking pieces that are known uh, and, and rethinking them and restructuring them, questioning the, the existing zoning, the existing uh, traditions of how to build the environment, and reorganizing that space to, to provide more space for nature uh, because it, it's needed, right? And it, and it is the most uh, efficient of all systems. Next. So we, we did look at the full, uh, the full South Bay and I think when, when questioned what, what is design, what's the capacity of design under, under these circumstances, I think being able to visualize these systems and, and bridge the gap to for, for the different agencies and the different groups that are all doing great things in the Bay Area to understand that the solutions don't need to be just engineering focus or just ecological, but uh, that through design, you can overlap these systems and make frameworks that are much richer and, and diverse and, and strong, right? They're, they're stronger than, than the, 
the, in, the individual pieces of, 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 a, of an armature. Next. Uh, but as part of our of effort, I think the, the biggest impact or, or where we learned the most wasn't necessarily the, the design of it, but more the communication and how to, how to engage the communities that, that were affected, kind of simplifying these, these complex issues into something that they could just much more pal palpable and, and, and straightforward and just that they could get quickly. Next. So we took the idea of the sponge and put it a, a bit on, on steroids and use it as a, as a communication and engagement uh, strategy. And we create, we kind of uh, wrap this little mini, mini hub to take all around the South Bay. Next. And this provided us the opportunity to really uh, use the, the RBD effort as, as an education process. Uh, I, we were surprised of how much interest the community had in learning about resiliency, uh, not understanding that how, how vulnerable their communities were and, and, and their kind of desire and thirst to, to learn more, to understand more. And right now we, we on a separate project, not, not RBD related, we continue to work in the East Palo Alto community. And it's amazing to see how the narrative has changed where two years ago, they would come to us asking, what is, what is resiliency? What are you talking about? where is this sea level rise going to occur? And now it's coming the other way around when they're questioning us, how is your project going to address sea level rise and climate change? Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that transformation in the community in, in such a short period of time. Next. So combining all of these systems, right? It, obviously this, there is opportunity to create amazing places, resilient places, places that deal with stormwater, um, places that, that, that deal with sea level rise, but also places for people. Um, I think during this corona uh, uh, situation, we've, we've learned, or not, we shouldn't have learned, but it's, it's kind of reemphasized the fact that we are part of nature, um, that the same way that nature needs more space, space to be resilient, people need space to be resilient, and, and open space allows for that uh, to happen. So. Uh, I think through design, we can combine these systems to really make uh, places for people. Next. And ultimately, uh, I think for, for all of us, that's the most important. These, these images are right here by my house in Lake Merritt during the corona. And, and it's proof that it's open space, it's space for, an, it's, it's nature that allows communities to come outside, to take a breather, to find health. So, for me, the resiliency challenge and how design deals with resiliency, it's not just about sea level rise or, 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 or nature, but it's, it's also about people and how, how can we use these spaces to make communities more resilient. Uh, next. And open space is the place where everyone's welcome, right? It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, your social group, your, your income, um, and this is a proof, right, that, that these spaces uh, allow for that. And this is just a small sample of field operations projects all over the world, Hong Kong, Cleveland, here in, in California, down in Santa Monica, where the open spaces that might have been designed for recreation or just, or just uh, have transformed into, into the centers for protests, uh, the centers where everyone feels welcome to come and speak up. So, for, to me, that's, that's also a critical part of resiliency um, and something that through design, we have the capacity to, to achieve when we are able to combine and bridge the gap of, of this multiplicity of, of systems. Next. So again, this is kind of a full picture, but as you can see, it's, it's, it's more than the, than the sum of its parts. And, and I think visualization uh, and design allows us to, to bridge the gap, to create a common vision where different agencies, different communities, uh, different perspectives, people with different priorities can come together to, to envision a future that can address a multiplicity of, of uh, complexities. And that's it, thank you. Um, well, I thought those were incredible uh, conversations that everybody proposed and I really appreciate everybody's perspective one thing, since this is about design, this is really the first kickoff of these webinars. And I just wanted to point out that uh, something that, that uh, 
uh, Veronica said too, that is really important that design is a way of visualizing something. It brings things together. It's the capacity to imagine a better future. And I agree with Marcel. I mean, we don't want to go back to where we were. We want to go somewhere else. And we can, as designers, help communities envision that, but only if we listen. So actually, I thought to just kick off from Veronica's comments, going to Josiah, because one point you made, Josiah, was that the, the um, open space is very, very little in those neighborhoods, Dogpatch and Bayview, Potrero Hill, the Mission, and Soma. And I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit, Josiah, as a, um, a, a really from an engineering and design perspective. Josiah? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, can you hear me? Yeah. I, okay. Um, yeah, I think there's, you know, several layers. Certainly one is green infrastructure, which we focus on a lot. Um, and the ability to manage water, whether it be flooding or sea level rise. Um, so certainly from a technical standpoint, you know, infrastructure needs space. Um, but it seems like, you know, I think we're also seeing, you know, with, with the pandemic that if people are forced close together and don't have space to get outside in a situation like we're in, um, I think it's much harder to control. I, I mean, I don't know the science behind why these communities that don't have open space have uh, higher infection rates, but I, you know, I think that's probably a contributor. I think that there are several reasons. Um, and I also wonder how much it contributes to stress. I mean, just mental health and stress factors at a time like this when we're, you know, confined to home, um, you know, if you live in Point Reyes and you can walk to a national seashore, you're allowed to do that, but you're not allowed to drive there and park there from somewhere else. So if you live in a neighborhood with no open space and you're only allowed to go to open space you can walk to, um, a time like this really just enhances that dramatically, right? And I think that contributes to all kinds of uh, magnification of inequity of access. Well, I think that was, that's a really, really great point. And I think we as designers need to make the case for open space and for even small open spaces. Um, Claire, one of the things that I thought was interesting about your talk was the idea of, of a restorative justice and, res and the connection to the San Quentin community. And I believe there even was a question that might have come up from one person in the audience I guess the question is, why didn't you connect with them? And how could we think about them as being part of the, of the San Rafael community? Because what Kevin pointed out is that in the ABC All Bay Collective, we have Alameda, East Oakland, and the airport. That's mm -hmm. three really diverse communities. In San Rafael, you have a pretty wealthy uh, group who live there. You have the canal community, and then you have San Quentin. And how can we think about bringing those groups together better? Blair. Well, Kathy, I think that's a project right there. And we should all like, you know, that was in a way the project we we're trying to set up, which is, you know, going back to what Josiah was trying to answer about science. I think one of the opportunities of Rebuild was this real dialogue between disciplines. And there's been a, I think it came out today or yesterday, there's been a very, there's some very detailed and it, because of COVID, all of a sudden, there's some real detailed data about how our cities are actually impacting the health of residents. And um, in particular, and this is something I remember, Marcel, we really focused on, which was in the bands of highways that were full of particulates that were impacting the air quality. And when you, especially as traffic um, increases, those communities that are below the fall of all of these freeways are impacted directly. And those are the communities whose numbers that are basically hospitalizations from the virus, in particular deaths, are higher when we have worse air pollution. So it's so clear that, that um, we have infrastructure, highways, 
San, we have communities that are detained, like San Quentin. We have communities that can't move also because of housing costs. And those three, the idea of having an opportunity instead of opportunities only being empty land, but if instead opportunities are those people and community. In other words, the development opportunity is the communities you have versus the de development opportunity only being about site, I think is a really important actually model shift that we could all have. And I think that's something that really came up in a lot of the projects, which is the value is the communities. The value isn't and the place for them. The value isn't just how many, uh, what kind of a site they have. Um, Kevin, I wondered if you might talk a little bit about um, thinking about a comment you made of, of the ABC or All Bay Collective group, the sites who had infrastructure, and this we found in almost every single site, infrastructure as a dividing barrier not only a cause of, of environmental pollution and so on, but also an environmental barrier as we saw in, in Marin City. But thinking about that, uh, thinking about that, can you hear me? Oh God. I can hear you. I'm sorry. Why don't you, Kevin, why don't you just take it from there? Uh, okay, that was a non-question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I have a little background noises. Am I uh, audible or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, look, ah, I think sorry, the, sorry. Th these issues of infrastructure and um, and the multi, the, the, you know, the agencies that actually have governance of these uh, the jurisdiction of the infrastructure makes it really, really complicated for communities to have um, a lot of actual power and say and how how these things um, can change. And that, that's really the hardest part of this, I think. I mean, to, to be able to move or change or somehow redesign these freeways and massive um, transit corridors to where they have a better relationship to impoverished and disempowered communities is, is so hard. And it really just is just really at the heart of how inequity is truly designed into our communities. And, um, and I totally agree with Claire, is that the value here and the place for investment is in the community, not in the real estate, not in the assets, not in the other physical things. It's, it's in the people and the communities. And that's still not to say that, it's, that things are easy to fix. The, you know, imagine how long it would take to, to actually implement change uh, on something like changing a freeway or moving a freeway. But we have to do it. We, we just have to... I just really believe we just have to begin there. And um, as Claire said, I think we really need to invest in the community. That's, that's the most valuable research. That's really the, the, the most valuable thing that we actually have is the people, the people that are here in our communities. And what's so sad is, is, um, is how divided we apparently are. Um, if you look at a broader geographical area across the country and, and the apparent lack of empathy for um, one another's conditions. And um, it's something that just seems, it's really depressing and we see it right now in the goings on that are happening um, across the country right now. And it's, um, you know, it's, it seems impossible to overcome actually, but we have, I mean, we're all here, we have to do that. We just have to get to work on that issue. Um, Marcella, I think I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to say something. Um, you actually were very provocative, I thought, when you said the role of design is not necessarily to get back to normal. I think the role of design is, I agree with you, totally. But can we think about together, and as this series of, of these six conversations, think about what that new normal might be? And certainly in the projects that you guys have all proposed, that was, you were doing that. but. It, could you further comment on that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good time for design to take the disruptor role um, and, and to do that with the main agency that we have, which is creativity. Um, it, 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 we're, we, we have, uh, you know, faculties and ways of thinking. And I would say um, 
um, modes of working where, you know, creativity is, is um, um, you know, it's, I think it's a, kind of our greatest resource at this point. Um, I think one thing you're going to see, and we all want to do big things, uh, everybody wants big things done, and what we're going to hear from agencies and cities and, and, um, and electeds is, we, we can't do anything. Uh, we don't have enough money. Uh, our tax base has fallen out. You know, there's a million reasons why. And, um, and, uh, and so I think, uh, you know, creativity um, is, is something that can pry at that. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we can, we can use what we know how to do uh, to show people a, a different direction. Um, I, I think the other thing that RBD did, and um, uh, and and uh, resilient by design, that is, um, and they did a good job of it. Was they kind of made a playbook um, for all of the basically the kind of fast and cheap ways that you can motivate and organize people. And I think that's a pretty good resource for now um, to shift for for designers in general to be. Um, to think of their ability to be more tactical and disruptive through creativity. Um, yeah, I'm going to actually stop you there because there are some questions from the audience. I thought that was a great answer. And Lucian, I, Lucian has uh, some questions for us. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, thanks to all of you who submitted questions. Um, this first question I think is pretty uh, relevant to our current moment. Um, an anonymous uh, attendee asked, what are the ways that climate adaptation and design professionals can dismantle racism and white supremacy with their projects and as contributors to the very field that institutionalized redlining and contributed to structurally racist policies within city making? Huh. Who would like to answer that one? How about Veronica? You were the... <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, I think it's already started in the sense that uh, as many have, have mentioned this call, that the power of design and decision making is being transferred again to the community, not again, probably for the first time, in a, in, to the communities and, and having designs that respond to them and are coordinated with them um, is becoming ever more critical. Uh, I think that it's, it's a deep rooted issue and, and it, it has to be tackled by everyone on all fronts if we can ever, if we can ever get somewhere. Um, but situations like the one we're living right now has only kind of heightened the need, right, for, for spaces that are inclusive and, and have brought light to the issues of, of, of the ripple effect of implications, right? I think now people are understanding that if you have a, a sector of the population that is unhealthy, we're all unhealthy. And if you have a sector of the population that is um, being brutalized, we're all being brutalized. They, no, one, like, no one can have peace if, if we don't have the right to it. Uh, and that goes, and that goes from, from open space to, to be able to take a walk and have a breather and, and, and have health. Um, to to social justice, like it's it's applic applicable in, in 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 all topics. I thought that was a great answer. Do you have another question, Lucian? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, in addressing uh, the coronavirus crisis, uh, Jeanette Kim asks, "What public decision making processes do you anticipate emerging in response to the COVID nineteen crisis? For example, regarding health needs, job loss, public space, etc." Where do you see those overlapping with or departing from public empowerment opportunities identified by the teams in RBD? I'm going to give this one to Kevin because you actually talked about governance quite a bit and funding. Um, I don't know if I can answer the question directly. Well, I don't know if anybody. Uh, can really. <laughs> um, but I think uh, this issue, and it's sort of related to the question that, that um, Veronica answered for the previous um, question. It's, we just need to get more, um, a more of the community needs to be better represented at the table for making the decisions. That's really what it comes down to. And one way to do it is by having a more, uh, a, a different type of process, decision-making process that involves a broader conversation with the community in a way that the community is empowered. Um, the other way to do it is to, um, is to transform all of the professions the professionals that are at the table making these decisions from landscape architects and architects and urban designers like ourselves to 
um, policymakers that are working for the cities to you know people that work in all levels of government and in the private sector. We we need to do all of those things. And so there's no like flip the switch answer to this. You know, I really think that it's um, it just runs so deep that that um, it's going to take a while. And that's not that's not an excuse to say I can't do anything about it because I I can. And and we all we all need to say that that we that we all have to do something. We all have to do everything we can to um, to kind of move this thing um, forward. And so when it comes to COVID, it, it's really it's about access to it's about access to health. It's about access to open space. It's about the ability to get outside, as Josiah was saying, so you don't go crazy and you have so, you're so confined. It's about all of these things. Um, and there's no like simple thing. I don't think that, that any of us can do right now to solve this. I think it's interesting that the um, one of the really great features of Re Resilient by Design was that it actually brought those groups together. It brought people who are in the government, it brought communities, it brought engineers of transportation, it brought water people. I mean, it was a very integrative thing. It could be a really a great example for how to think about this in the future. Yeah, and, you know, I'll say one one thing about the the, the RBD process in, in a slightly critical way is that, um, you know, it started actually in a way ahead of the communities. It needed to because it had a, a really short time frame for what it was trying to do, and so it did that, and and um, was sort of I guess imperfect in that way. But I would really hope that the next step would be would be now the community is coming back to sort of say what they want. What did, what did they get out of that? Where do they want to go with these things? And what are they, what are they talking about? And, um, you know, it's, I don't know about the, the rest of you all who participated in this, um, but sadly for myself, I'm not as engaged with that, with that community and those issues anymore. You know, that project sort of ended and we're busy working on other things. And it's, it's, uh, it's been difficult to stay involved and engaged and, and, and in touch in a way that I was hoping we could be helpful with those communities to, to um, follow their leads and help them get where they want to go. I don't know if anyone else has a different um, experience. There. I just thought it was worth adding something that I think we are really learning out of the events um, uh, over the last four days is that as designers, um, architects, planners, landscape architects, listening to uh, black landscape architects, black architects, NOMA, other people about that we have a community also and a lot of resources and a lot of talents there that I think that who really are looking for more opportunities. And at the same time, I think communities are looking for more opportunities. So sometimes things are about money, but they're, I think they're also about having younger, you know, we have a huge number of more women and more minority architects and landscape architects than ever about to graduate into an economy that has seems to have little opportunity. And I keep looking at whether there's hundreds of pickleweed parks and there's all these things, how the, the terrain that we all set up could be actually an amazing moment for these, the whole, the whole next generation of designers. And I just want to I just want to point out. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just want to point out that um, our future uh, webinars, we have five more webinars coming up, are going to address the top this topic as well. So please stay tuned for those. I just think that one of the one of the things that Claire just said is really important that that these people emerging from schools and young people are not completely discouraged by this uh, by by the job market by their future. We want the future for these young people to be really bright and for everybody, honestly. But I think design can help. I believe that it really has the power to make changes, to be disruptive, but also to be disruptive for the very, very public good. And that's why we're all here. Do you have one more question? Sure. Um, <laughs> there's a yeah, so Richard Mullane asks, uh, there's been a lot written lately about public space, open public space and racism, some opinions that challenge the traditional open space is for everyone narrative that we as designers have come to expect. 
accept, sorry. I'm wondering how the panelists feel about this and how design might tackle this challenge head on. And we only have about less than a minute left. So if we quickly, okay, quickly one, answer this one. And Veronica, you. Anybody, it's really open to anyone. Oh, just, yeah. Well, maybe I am an, an idealist because I, I generally do believe that open space is, is the canvas where everyone is welcome, right? And when it comes to responding to an, an example uh, I'll give is, is Cleveland Public Square. We, we rebuilt the, the center of the city and within a day, there was members of all ages and all races playing together in the water feature. And I think th that might be the, the genesis of, of more tolerance and understanding and realizing that we're all just human is when you engage and you, and you play with and you interact with people that are different from you, um, you it, it helps to fade away the ignorance of of, of difference, right, or, or the fear of difference, um, and to embrace it. We're not we're not all the same. It's okay not to be all the same. But when you have the opportunity to to get to know uh, people from other cultures, from other places, from other ethnicities, you 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 learn from them. You embrace them. You care about them. And I and I think it is a way um, exposing people of all ages to each other is is a way to to help in in, in the equation. It's a complex issue, but I am an idealist. I do believe that if, if it's really hard for someone to grow up to be a racist if, if, they, if, they, if they play in, in, the, in the same playground as a child, you know? And, 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 and that's, that's a starting point. It's, com it's all about common ground. And speaking of that, we're, we're at yeah. one o'clock already. And I think it's been a wonderful event to engage with all of you, all of your friends of, of mine and friends of, of uh, this uh, wonderful challenge that Allison and Amy and others uh, uh, put forward. And I look forward to people, you guys and, and the audience engaging in the next five of these meetings. And you know, after that, I think we can figure out how to, what to do next. Is there's gotta be something. Anyway, thank you all very much. Stay tuned next Tuesday at noon. Um, we all look forward to being with there with you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.